This morning we are continuing in Luke's gospel. We're going to be looking at Luke 12, verses 1 through 12. And again, the overarching theme here is that our Lord is encouraging us not to be afraid of our enemies. He's going to tell his disciples, you, don't, you, know, you need to be on your guard against the Pharisees, but you don't need to be afraid of them. And he'll give many reasons why. But let's go ahead and read the text, and then we'll see what the Lord has to tell us. Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> Under these circumstances, after so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were stepping on one another, he began saying to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. But there is nothing covered up that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Accordingly, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in the inner rooms will be proclaimed upon the housetops. I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two cents? Yet not one of them is forgotten before God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. And I say to you, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will confess him also before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. When they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Now, as I've said, there's, there's a lot in this text, and we're not going to look at every single detail, but hopefully we'll be able to touch on everything. But I, I want us to see these as so many reasons why we should not be afraid of man. Now, we should fear the Lord, and we'll see you know, what, that, what that means, but we should not be afraid of man. Instead, we should trust that the Lord will be with us, that we might do His work. Now, last week, uh, I've already mentioned, we saw Jesus exposing the hypocrisy of the scribes or the lawyers. They're essentially the same group of people and the Pharisees. Many of the scribes were actually also Pharisees. The problem with them was, again, with their hypocrisy, they cleaned the outside of themselves. They, they were good actors. They could make people think that they were serving the Lord. But inside, they were evil. They had evil motives. The reasons why they were doing these things was not to honor the Lord, but it was self-serving and, uh, well, basically self-serving. They were self-absorbed. They wanted the honor of men. They wanted the privileges that, that would come from Rome for playing this part. Well, for their hypocrisy, our Lord went on to pronounce six woes against them, six indictments of particular sins they were guilty of, and the warning. The woe means, remember, how horrible it's going to be for you in the day of judgment for these crimes if you do not repent. And I think the implication for many of them was that they were not going to repent. And that's, why the reason, that's the reason why our Lord Jesus was pronouncing woes on them. But as we know, they did not listen. Instead, they did what most do when you point out their sins. They became hostile and they tried to find a way to turn things around on Jesus in order to condemn him instead. Now Luke tells us that by the time Jesus left the Pharisee's house, the Pharisee who had invited him over and where this conversation actually took place, thousands of people had gathered to hear him. And so our Lord Jesus did what he does, you know, what he always does when, when he has the opportunity to minister, he taught them. Now, it says here that he was teaching his disciples, but of course, with all these thousands around, they were also hearing him. It was something like the Sermon on the Mount. Remember how Jesus sat down, his disciples gathered around him, but there were also all these other people, but he began to teach his disciples, right? But yet the people also heard. That's what he's doing here. 
His topic he drew from what he had just experienced in the house of the Pharisees. The scribes and the Pharisees were trying to intimidate him into silence by asking him questions to try to find some grounds upon which they could accuse him to Rome. Jesus knew that they would soon be doing the same to his disciples, and so he encourages them not to fear, but to hold their ground. Now, we don't have to face Pharisees, at least these Pharisees today. I mean, uh, there are Pharisees that exist, but they're not basically in our culture. We don't interact with them, not like the disciples did in those days. But we do have many people who are standing against us, who are our enemies, who would try to stop us from proclaiming the gospel. So we do need this encouragement not to be afraid of them. So Jesus, first of all, tells his disciples, and he tells us, not to be afraid because our enemies, first of all, will one day have to face justice. Now, when he tells his disciples in verse 1, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. I believe he means, first of all, that they should be on their guard against them, against their deception, against the fact that they you know, would say one thing, but then they would do another, that they claimed to be God's servants, but they were really working against him. Basically, these men were the greatest enemies that Jesus and his church had to face in those days, at least humanly speaking. We know there was one working behind them, the devil, and he was the one who was trying to overcome the work of the gospel. He was using these men who were the spiritual leaders of Israel, but humanly speaking, they were the greatest enemies, and the disciples had to face them. They had to be on their guard against them. Well, we have enemies as well in uh, the world today that we also have to be on our guard against. As a matter of fact, these enemies are in the church as well as in the world. The Pharisees were actually the leaders of the church, the Old Testament church, weren't they? So we might say technically they were in the church. And those who are in the church, I think, are particularly dangerous because they hold to a form of godliness. They claim to be Christians. They claim to be mature Christians. Uh, who are leading other people, but they really don't have the power of godliness, the power of holiness working in their lives. And we know there are many who have actually uh, been elevated to positions of leadership over large congregations who are really strangers to the gospel of grace, who really do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. These people can be dangerous for the church. They can be dangerous for us. Jesus tells us we need to watch out for them. We need to make sure that we don't let their examples fool us into thinking that because they're doing it and they're prospering, that we can do it, that this kind of Christianity is okay, that we can basically claim to be Christians, claim to have died to ourselves and be living to Christ and yet live for ourselves that we can have both the world and heaven, that we can embrace the world, we can embrace everyone and support even those who practice wickedness and still be faithful servants of Christ. You see, when spiritual leaders in the church do that, it encourages other people to do the same, and that's exactly what was happening in Jesus' day. Don't let their example encourage you to do the same. Those who looked up to the Pharisees in those days and followed their example, how, what do you think they think today? You think they were happy with their choice? I think they're very disappointed that they followed them. And I think we will be as well if we follow those who say they follow, are following Jesus, but who really are not. So Jesus says, be on your guard, first of all, against their example. But he also told his disciples not to be afraid of them, on the other hand. You know, watch out, they're going to try to thwart you. Don't follow their example but also don't be afraid of what they might be able to do because Jesus says, first of all, that he was going to deal with them in his time. He would expose who they are and what they are. He says in verse 2, but there is nothing covered up that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Now, this is actually a reason not to be afraid because he says in a parallel passage in Matthew where he's essentially dealing with the same topic, 
Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. I think the implication is that we shouldn't be afraid of our enemies because one day Jesus is going to expose them. And the implication is also deal with them. Now, since that is the case, Jesus is telling us we shouldn't be afraid. We shouldn't be afraid to hold to the truth, even if these men are intimidating us, trying to get us to stop, again, expressing it. And we know the whole world, and even a large portion, not of the evangelical church, but of those churches that have gone more liberal, are trying to stop us from preaching the gospel. The Lord's going to expose them. The Lord is going to deal with them. But he tells us, don't be afraid, hold to the truth, live the truth, share the truth with others. And I think that is what Jesus has in mind here in verse 3. Accordingly, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in the inner rooms will be proclaimed upon the housetops. I don't think Jesus here is telling his disciples that I'm going to expose you too and put you to open shame. I don't think that's what he's saying. But I think what he's saying here is that though you may have been sharing these things more in, in, in a private settings. Don't be afraid to proclaim it openly for everyone to hear. Do not let them intimidate you. Now, secondly, Jesus tells us not to be afraid because there's really not that much that our enemies can really do to us. He says in verse 4, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. I mean, all they can do is kill you. That's, that's the worst. And then he says, you are out of their reach forever. Now, this raises an, an interesting question, doesn't it? <laughs> Should we be afraid of death? Should we be afraid to die? Well, not if we're trusting the Lord Jesus, right? We shouldn't be afraid of death because Paul tells us Jesus has taken the sting out of death, right? We no longer have to be afraid of it because it's not going to plunge us into ruin. It's going to open the door for us into heaven. That's why the Apostle Paul, when he writes to the Philippians, actually tells them that he looks forward to death. And as a matter of fact, he prefers death. Remember what I used as an illustration recently of uh, Stonewall Jackson's testimony when he was asked on his deathbed, you know, he, when he was told, you're going to be in heaven today. Are you willing to accept that? And he says, I prefer it. So did the Apostle Paul. He writes in Philippians 1 verse 21, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And then he goes on to say in verse 23, To depart and to be with Christ is very much better. And that's what he preferred. You know, one thing that makes martyrs for various religions so dangerous is that they are not afraid to die for their cause. And because of that, there's really nothing that they will not do. Jesus is telling us here that we can be just as fearless as they are if we are not afraid to die. We can have this kind of courage, but there are certain things that we need, of course, to be at work in our lives. First of all, we need to believe what Jesus says. We need to believe it's true. We need to believe that there really is a heaven. We need to believe that heaven is far better than what we're experiencing here. And we need to believe that we are the Lord's and that if we die or when we die, we are going to go to be with him. Okay, that is one very important way to strengthen our faith and that, or our courage. And that's the reason why the Apostle Paul was able to do everything he did. Besides his gifts and his energies and so forth, he was not afraid to die for the gospel. As long as we're afraid, we're not going to do what we need to do. But Jesus tells us here that there's another way to strengthen our courage even more. And that is to fear God in verse 5. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Now, the fear of the Lord is something that we are familiar with here, but again, you, you rarely hear about it in churches today. But it's a good thing. The fear of the Lord is a good thing. The fear of the Lord is a gracious thing that the Spirit of God actually works in our hearts. And the reason why he gives us this fear is to help us 
to grow more into the likeness of Jesus. Solomon tells us in the Proverbs some of the things that the fear of the Lord can do. In chapter 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Chapter 8, verse 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Proverbs 10, 27, the fear of the Lord prolongs life. Chapter 14, verse 26, in the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence. Chapter 19, verse 23, the fear of the Lord leads to life. There are many good things that come from fear. Jesus tells us in our passage, the fear of the Lord takes away the fear of man. That's a good thing. And the way that it does it is by giving us something or someone greater to fear than man, and that is God. Oswald Chambers, the 20th century Scottish Baptist, writes this, the remarkable thing about God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. The fear of the Lord takes away the fear of man. Now, I don't think Jesus here is necessarily threatening his disciples and telling them, look, if you're afraid of man, then you better be afraid of God because God's going to cast you into hell unless you get over your fear of man. I don't think that's what he's saying. Because on numerous occasions, his disciples failed and they, they were afraid of man and they, fought, they basically sinned against the Lord, but the Lord did not give them over. I mean, think about if that were true, where would that lead Peter who denied Jesus three times? He also later, uh, I mean, we, we can't, Peter didn't fail many times after the day of Pentecost, but there were times when he did fail. Uh, and again, out of fear of man, remember that time he withdrew from the, uh, from the Gentiles because Paul came and visited and he was afraid of what the Jews might think of him and so forth, so Paul rebuked him for that. What about the disciples who abandoned Jesus when he needed them the most? You know, the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will be scattered. Uh, what about John Mark when he abandoned the mission field uh, with uh, Paul and Barnabas? And um, Paul didn't want him to go with him on the next missionary journey. That's what caused the split between him and Barnabas. Well, what about these men? Did God cast them away? No. The Lord granted them mercy and forgiveness. I don't think he's threatening us with hell here if we don't happen to measure up. But what he is telling us is that we need to fear the Lord. We need to respect the one who has the authority not only to take away our lives, but he also has authority to cast into hell. He has that authority. That's who he is. We need to respect him because he has saved us from this in the Lord Jesus Christ. But yet we know that he could have done it if that was his will. And we need to respect him also because we know that on the day of judgment, he is the one who will consign the souls of the wicked into hell. We need to fear him because he has that authority. So there is a real fear here. I'm not saying we shouldn't fear him. And certainly if we are not believers and we end up fearing man all the time and never doing what the Lord calls us to do, that can be problematic. If we don't know the Lord, we better fear him because we will meet him as our judge. But I don't think Jesus is telling us here that God is going to cast us into hell. He says, don't be afraid, right, of man. Be afraid of God. Respect him and his authority and do what he calls you to do because he is the one with the power of life and death. He is the one with the power uh, either to condemn or to save. Jesus tells us thirdly not to be afraid because God is aware of our situation, whatever they might be, whatever situation we're in. He says in verses 6 and 7, are not five sparrows sold for two cents? Yet not one of them is forgotten before God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Now, in those days, sparrows were used for food among the poorest of God's people. We might be tempted to think these sparrows are being sold for Offerings, there were offerings that included birds, but they didn't actually use sparrows. They were used for food. And because there were so many sparrows, because they were so easily caught, because they had so little meat on them, they were next to worthless. And that's what Jesus is basically saying, are not five of them sold for two cents. And yet, God is aware of them. 
God is aware of every single one of them. Not one of them falls to the ground. Not one of them dies. Apart, he says, from your father. Your father is aware of it. He knows. Now, if that's true of the sparrows, how much more is he aware of our circumstances? How much more is he concerned about us who are worth much more, Jesus says, than the sparrows? God is so aware of us, he even knows the number of hairs that are on our head. By the way, the average head <laughs> has about 100,000 hairs on it. Not everyone, right? I mean, we're all, all, all the men here, you know, we're, we're losing our hairs. <laughs> but God knows how much is there. He is so intimately acquainted with us. David writes in Psalm, I think it's 134, just how intimately acquainted he is with all of our ways. And he knows all about us, even before there is a word on our tongue. He knows what it's going to be. He has infinite knowledge. So he not only knows where we are, and whether we're safe or in danger, he's concerned about us. He cares about us. He cares about us enough, actually, to help us. Remember, Jesus is going to later encourage his disciples when he sends them out on the Great Commission. I am with you always. Okay, that is the great promise that God is with us. The one who cares for us is with us. So the implication is you don't need to be afraid. Jesus tells us not to be afraid forth because if we will own him in this world, if we'll stand up and be courageous and confess him before men, he will own us when it counts the most. Jesus says in verse 8, And I say to you, everyone who confesses me before men the Son of Man will confess him also before the angels of God. And he also, of course, before the Father. If the worst should happen to us, and the worst is that the enemies take our lives and we go to heaven, we know that Jesus is going to welcome us into heaven. But even more than that, we know that on the day of judgment, when we stand before him, Jesus is going to own us. He's going to confess us. He is going to say, you belong to me. You are mine. He's going to say it when it matters the most. That should give us encouragement. But let's not miss the second part of this, which is a warning that has to do with the fear of the Lord. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Now, that's not really something that a true believer can do. I mean, we can do it like, like Peter. And we can fail, and we can grow weak, and we can, we can falter. But we can't live that way our whole lives. And Peter didn't live that way his whole lives. And we don't use that example as an excuse for us to deny the Lord. If our lives should be a pattern of denying him before men, then we need to heed this warning. And we need to turn from our sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this really only applies, of course, to an unbeliever, but we need to understand Jesus did direct it toward his disciples because it also has a purpose in our lives, right? Those who actually know him and who love him and who are tempted to deny him. There is a warning here that is meant for our good. It's to make us afraid so that we won't do that. There's two motivations in the Christian life. The love of God, his love, his care, his concern, and his protection and the fact that he has the authority over our souls. And Jesus tells us that if we deny him, he will deny us. These, these things are to make us afraid so that we will go the right direction. He doesn't do this to terrorize us. He does it so that we will go the right direction. I mean, isn't that the reason why when we're raising our children, we tell them, don't do this, otherwise this is going to happen, right? We tell them so they'll go the right way. It's a gracious thing, and it's a good thing. The fear of the Lord is a motivation to live a holy life. Jesus tells us not to be afraid, fifthly, because he is willing to show mercy to those who repent and to judge those who do not. And I think that's what he has in mind here in verse 10, where he says, first of all, he will show mercy to those who repent and believe. He says, and everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. Now, I think the implication here is if they repent and believe, obviously. It's not going to be forgiven if they don't. And this is to remind the disciples that there are those in the world who may, at their, in their day, they may have spoken against me. 
but they can still be saved, right? He still has his people in the world today who may have rejected Jesus on one occasion or another that he intends to save. Those who haven't gone so far in their sin against him that they are beyond hope. If that were the case, then our Lord would already have come if there was nobody else to be saved, right? Because when everybody is saved, who's going to be saved, our Lord is going to come again. The fact that he hasn't come means there are still people here that he is willing to forgive. And the fact that there are should encourage us to overcome our fears and to reach out to them, especially the fear that all we're doing is for nothing, that our efforts are going to be fruitless. Nobody's going to believe. No, there are going to be people who believe. The Lord says he will bring his sheep to himself when we proclaim his word, when we share his gospel with other people. But he also says there are those that he will judge. Now, this, again, is directed, at least in the hearing of his disciples, against the Jewish leaders. Those who have gone too far, those who have sinned to the point where God is no longer willing to show mercy, is there a point of no return? I think the Bible says that there is a point of no return, especially the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is a point of no return. He says in verse 10, but he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. And the reason why it won't be forgiven is because the person who commits this sin is not going to receive Jesus because they have so offended the Holy Spirit that he's not going to work in their lives. Now, we, again, we saw before this was directed mainly against the religious leaders of those days who had rejected Jesus and not only him, but accused him of casting out demons by the prince of demons, calling the Holy Spirit the devil. And really what this means is that their hearts were so hardened against the Lord that God had given them over. There was no longer hope for them, the unpardonable sin. But we also have to recognize that today there is a similar sin that can be committed where a person resists the Holy Spirit to the point where the Lord gives them up. You know, we don't know where that point is. We don't. Um, but when you reach the point where God's no longer going to work with you in your heart when you're so grieved and quenched and resisted and so forth, like the author to the Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 6, having tasted of the, of the heavenly gift and the, good, you know, the, the word of God and the powers of the age to come, having basically some taste of these these uh, spiritual blessings of the kingdom of heaven, they turn away from him and reject him and side with those who crucified him. The Lord says there's no longer any hope for them, right? So there is this point of no return. And if you don't come to Jesus, then guess what? Every sin that you've ever committed becomes unpardonable, doesn't it? And you'll have to be held accountable for every single one of them. Now, this cannot happen to a believer. Okay, we understand that. But it can happen to somebody who doesn't believe. And so if you don't believe in Jesus, make sure you're trusting in him this morning. This again reminds us that we should not be afraid because the Lord is going to deal with those who resist the Holy Spirit, those who reject the gospel, those who basically are enemies who might come against us. Even as our Lord said earlier, everything that they've done is going to be exposed on the day of judgment and they're going to have to answer for it. Well, then finally, Jesus tells us this. And by the way, let me just say one more thing about the, uh, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which I said before, the unpardonable sin, the point of no return. The person who actually goes there, the person who actually, you know, has sinned to that degree, hates the Lord so much that he doesn't care, okay? He's not seeking forgiveness. He's not the person who's weeping and crying and looking for forgiveness and you know, that somehow he's, the door of heaven is closed against him. It's the person who hates him so much that he would never come to him. So this is not talking about a believer who commits some hor horrible sin, that there's no hope for them because they've sinned against so much grace and against so much light. It's talking about somebody who never knew the Lord and who will never come to know him. No believer can commit the unpardonable sin. There is always mercy and grace for you if you have trusted in Jesus, okay? No one can snatch you out of, his, out of the Father's hand. Nothing in heaven and earth will ever separate you from him, okay? So that is 
the confidence we have in Jesus, and that's why we shouldn't be afraid. Now, finally, Jesus tells us we shouldn't be afraid <clears throat> because the Spirit is going to give us the ability to be His witnesses. I mean, sometimes we don't want to tell others about Jesus because we're afraid of what we're going to say. It's not going to make any sense. Uh, we're going to be too timid. It's not going to come across the right way. Uh, do you think these disciples were all concerned about that? Were they all extroverts, you know? Did they all have, were they all, you know, basically strong natural leaders that weren't afraid of men? No, I don't think so. That's why the Lord had to encourage them in this way. In verses 11 and 12, when they bring you before the synagogues, by the way, these, these Pharisees, they are going to arrest you. They are going to put you in prison. Some of you are even going to stand before kings. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. As we read the Bible, don't we find out that that's exactly what the Lord did? When Peter and John were arrested on more than one occasion, didn't they speak boldly before the Jewish leaders? When the disciples were arrested, didn't they do the same? Stephen, when he was dragged before the Sanhedrin, he was very bold, even though he knew it would lead to his death. And of course, the Apostle Paul, speaking before the Jews, speaking even before kings. Where did he get the power to do that? Came through the Holy Spirit. Now, the Spirit of God doesn't work exactly in our lives in the same way that he worked in the lives of the apostles, but we do have to believe the Spirit of God works to bring scriptures to our minds. He works to give us boldness to be able to stand you know, on, on the gospel and proclaim him before men. As a matter of fact, I think we'd be very much surprised just how much courage the Lord will actually give us if we will trust him. Paul writes to Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. The point is, we don't need to be afraid. You know, yes, there are going to be many enemies as we go out to proclaim the gospel. Whenever you open your mouth, there's going to be, you know, some backlash from that. There's going to be people who are offended, who get angry. In most cases, I think probably majority cases, especially when it's public. But we don't need to be afraid. All we need to do is trust that the Lord will do what he actually said he would do in the text we've just read and step out in faith. We need to believe that he is faithful. You know, what does it mean to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, it means to trust in Him for our salvation, His righteousness alone, and not our own. But it also means to, to trust Him when He tells us that He's going to do something, that He actually is going to do it. You know, that's, that's what faith also does. So we just simply need to believe that and then to act on it. So may the Lord give us the grace that we need to do that. Let's, let's bow, shall we, for a moment of prayer and, and let's ask the Lord to apply His Word. And then as we're praying, let's also pray the Lord would prepare us to come to the table. Remember, our Lord Jesus Christ is the example that God has given to us of trust. He lived a life of, of faith. You know, faith is not believing that something might be true. It's, it's the certainty that it is true, Right? And he came into this world and he lived the life that we're called to live. He absolutely trusted his father to watch over him and protect him. And his father did protect him and protected him, even kept him through the cross. And he knew as he gave his life for what he did for us, that his father was not going to disown him, but would receive what he did and would raise him from the dead. Jesus is that example of trust. And that's what the table reminds us of this morning. So let's think about that as we, as we pray.